This is the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I'm your host, Stanford professor Jeffrey Pfeffer. Every other week, we have on this show an interesting person to talk about lessons in power and how to accelerate your career. And today, I am delighted to welcome my literally old friend, Nick Binkley. <laughs> Nick and I have known each other since 1960 when we went to the Webb School of California and we had adjoining rooms. Nick is fond of pointing out that my room was larger than his, but, uh, but that, that, that's <laughs> probably- larger. <laughs> that probably was an exaggeration. Nick went on from the Webb School of California to go to Colorado College and to join a series of financial institutions he rose to the ranks at Security Pacific Bank, became vice chair of Security Pacific and on their board of directors. And in that role, managed basically all the non-bank aspects of Security Pacific, such as venture capital and alternative financial products. After the Bank of America bought Security Pacific, Nick Binkley was the vice chair and a member of the board of directors of the Bank of America. At that time, one of the largest banks in the United States. When his golden parachute matured, he pulled the cord, if you will, left the Bank of America and started with two colleagues, a venture capital firm managing the Bass Brothers money, among other assets, called Forrest Binkley & Brown, Recently, a few years ago, Forrest Binkley and Brown wound down, and so now Nick is in semi-retirement doing what he really loves to do, which is singing and songwriting. He has released four albums. I have all of them, actually multiple copies of all of them, and the joke is, of course, I'm his best music friend. In any event, welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast, my old friend Nick Binkley. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's great to be with you. And uh, I think that was a pretty good introduction there. We do go back a long ways. And yes, Jeffrey did, in fact, have uh, a larger room than I did. In <laughs> fact, it was at least twice as big as my room. But we had a peephole between the two of us. And we, every once in a while, shared comments after lights out. Yes. In any event. So for those who don't know your career history, Nick, briefly... I talked about how you wound up as the vice chair of the Bank of America and before that, Security Pacific. Where did you begin your banking career? I began my banking career at Chase Manhattan Bank in Wall Street, 1973. And when I was reading Jeff's book, Seven Rules of Power, one of the, I think the first rule is get out of your own way. And there's, I think it's the imposter syndrome. I'm not sure whether that's in that part or not, but I went from a guitar-playing Peace Corps volunteer and campaign manager of my brother's campaign for Congress to banker. But in my year and a half or almost two years in the Peace Corps in Tunisia, I really wanted to be a uh, international banker. I felt that the thing that was holding back the Tunisian economy was formation of capital. Uh, very educated public, but the formation of capital. And I said, you know, so there's this point in Jeff's book where he says, visualize what you want to be. And so I, there in the Peace Corps in 1968, I was visualizing, you know, I'd rather be an international banker than somebody in the Foreign Service. So 73, I joined Chase Bank. After about two or three months, I had accumulated enough money to actually buy a suit. <laughs> And this gets me to the break the rules subject of Jeff's book. But when you, it's sort of your first real job. And that paycheck every two weeks was lovely. And I started saving up my money to buy a suit. And one day I went by the window of Barney's downtown in Manhattan and I saw the most beautiful suit. I said, I got to have that suit. And I went in and I bought it, and I was so proud of that suit. It was the first real suit that I owned. And I wore it the next day to the bank. Well, there's a mezzanine overlooking Chase Plaza at 1 Wall Street. As everybody gets out of the subway, they walk in in this crowd coming to work. And I put on my jacket after, because I think it was in late spring, it was warm in the subway. I put my coat on and my new suit, and I was so proud of this suit, and I walked in, 
And I got to my seat in the credit department of Chase, and I was a lowly financial statement analyst at the time. And my head guy comes over to me, and he said, uh, where, where did you get this suit? And I said, at Barney's. He said, have you looked around lately? Do you see any plaid suits in this group? <laughs> and I looked around. I said, no, I don't see. He says, there's a Brooks Brothers store on Bank Street. I would suggest a pinstripe suit as opposed to your plaid suit. And he then said, as the crowd got off the subway and was walking into the bank, he said he was watching and he saw this funny peacock in the crowd with this plaid. It was orange and white suit. It was like a superfly suit. any rate, I went directly to Brooks Brothers, bought a pinstripe suit, put my head down in the Chase credit program, which at the time was the number one program in the United States. It was eight months of training. The first week was learning the undergraduate accounting. And you took a test. If you passed the test, you went on to graduate school accounting, which was three weeks. If you passed that test, you went on to the credit modules. If you pass the credit modules, you go on to becoming a first-tier banker. Out of a class of 32, seven survived. I was one of the seven that survived. And in fact, I did so well. And I think in Jeff's book, he talks about playing the game. And this is playing the game well after the plaid suit incident. I buckled down and I developed an approach to statement analysis, which is called the Binkley tree. It was based on the DuPont ROE approach to statement analysis. I did it so well that they asked me for my first assignment to go to London and teach the credit program to NBA recruits into the Chase program. That was my first assignment. And out of that, they assigned me to my first officer level was to Beirut in the Middle East Petroleum Division following the 1973 war with Israel and the formation of OPEC. And I spent about a year in that position until the Civil War. And after the first round of that Civil War, I looked at my new wife, who we'd just gotten married, and I said, you know what? I don't trust this. I mean, I lived in Tunisia. I speak a little Arabic. I speak French. I feel comfortable here in Lebanon in terms of the language. But the Christian-Muslim divide is inseparable. Uh, They're at each other's throats. We got to get out of here. And I submitted my resignation, went back to New York and wrote music for two years. So that was my first banking experience, Jeffrey. That's a wonderful story. And as I recall, you wrote a song called Pinstripe Brain. Um, I did. Pinstripe Brain. (laughs) How would you like to ride across the wide open range tied to the man with a pinstripe brain? (laughs) There you go. I love it. Now, you also, when we talked the other day, you told a story or a lesson when you were at Security Pacific and you were at a certain level, I think you were vice president, of which there are billions in a bank, and all of a sudden, your career took off. And in 10 years, you went from a vice president at Security Pacific to the vice chair and member of the board of directors of the Bank of America. And just prior to that, of course, vice chair of Security Pacific Bank before it was bought by the Bank of America. What happened to accelerate your career during those 10 years and what lessons would you learn from that or want to impart to anybody? Well, yeah, we talked about that. At some point, you need to change the narrative about yourself. And I wasn't quite sure how that would work. But one day I got a call from the vice chairman and CFO of Security Pacific and said, how would you like to leave Los Angeles, leave banking and go and be the deputy administrator of all the non-bank subsidiaries of the holding company in San Diego? There are about nine subsidiaries. They counted at the time of about 10% of the assets of Security Pacific, but 25% of the after-tax profits. Very profitable group, including venture capital, asset-based lending, insurance, personal finance, and a number of offices. In fact, 
we had 350 offices in the United States for the personal finance business, like beneficial finance, if you recall that business. Uh, Finn Casperson ran that business for many years. We had total 500 offices in 11 countries. We made medallion loans to taxi drivers in Hong Kong. We did Serican lending in Tokyo. We did personal finance in Frankfurt. We did condo lending in Monaco. We had large aircraft leasing out of London. We're in the real estate business in London. We financed the arena in London, in the Docklands. It was all over the world. It was an amazing experience, but very confusing to bankers. We didn't hire bankers into those businesses. We hired business-specific executives into those businesses. So if you go into venture capital, you hire somebody from the venture capital industry, you go into personal finance, you don't hire somebody from retail banking, you hire somebody from the retail finance business or insurance the same. But every year we had a <laughs> we had an offsite for the financial services system. That's what it was called down in San Diego. And all the senior executives from the bank would come to the offsite, including the president of the bank, the chairman and CEO of the bank, the vice chairman, the head of retail banking, the head of corporate banking, and their wives, and they would come and mingle with us who were in a business that basically they did not understand. They were bankers. And one year at one of these FSS, as we call it, offsites, I was allocated the assignment of presenting what the FSS did to the wives of these senior executives in a morning session. The wives, as you might suspect, know a little bit about banking and what their husbands do, but they really don't know what the FSS does. My boss hated this assignment every year. He was old school. He hated talking to the wives because he assumed the wives wouldn't understand what the FSS did. So he asked me to do the assignment. And I thought about it and I said, I wonder where this is going. I was a little reluctant. I was the deputy head of the group. I could have assigned it to somebody else. But instead, I took it on and saw it as an opportunity to present my communication skills to these wives about what we do. Well, that night, after a successful presentation to the wives, I got cornered by the chairman and CEO of the corporation, and he said, Binkley, what was that joke that you told the wives at the wives session of the FSS today? He said, could you recount that joke to me? He said, my wife told me that they had everybody laughing uncontrollably. I recounted the joke. He looked at me and he said, Binkley, you're a valuable piece of horse flesh. And I took that as a compliment because it could have ended horse with another word. And he said, I know head Connor is going to be knocking on your door, but before you make any decisions, call me. And in fact, a couple of months later, I did get a call from the chairman of another bank in California offering the head of corporate strategy to me and at three times my salary. I did not take it. I turned it down and called the chairman and we settled on a new trajectory for me. And well, Nick, I really like the story of how your career took off. Basically, when you were asked and accepted an opportunity to give a talk about what your part of the bank did to the wives of the senior executives, I think many people underplay or don't appreciate the importance of family members, husbands, wives, even children, to forming impressions. And part of your brand building accelerated by making a presentation in a humorous way, but also, and as, as you've told me in the past, in a thoughtful and effective way. And so the wives said, wow, here's somebody who's smart, who's clever, who talks to us as, you know, intelligent adults, and really, I think, came to appreciate some of your communication skills and formed a positive impression of you, which always helps. I think people underestimate not only the importance of family members, but to have a broad base of people who appreciate their skills. And I think that's a wonderful illustration. That was one, you talked, Jeff, about branding. 
while I was at the FSS and eventually became chairman and CEO of that whole operation, I started an internal magazine called Straight Talk to answer questions and also advance my own plans for the FSS. And I was featured in this monthly magazine with an editorial. John McCain, I think, borrowed the Straight Talk mantra for his presidential campaign in 2008. But that really helped me cement my place within the organization. And after that encounter with the chairman and my assuming the position of chairman and CEO after my boss retired of the entire financial service system, I was pulled into a number of meetings at the office of the chief executive and was then presenting to the board at Security Pacific the strategic and operating plans of the financial services system. And I got to know directors and directors got to know me. One day I got a call from the chairman. He said, Binkley, I know you don't play golf, but we're going to have a golf outing out at Palm Springs. He said, bring your wife. We're having the wives of the office of the CEO, and we're going to go over strategic planning for the organization. And I want you there. It's the first time he had ever reached out to me in that way. And I went out to this meeting and we got into the nitty gritty of Security Pacific Bank being the second largest bank in California, but really didn't register on a national basis. But here we had a holding company full of subsidiaries with a national footprint. Our personal finance business was in almost 40 states. And this is before national banking. This is before the barriers came down. It's before the deregulation, in other words. Before the deregulation, exactly. And so I proposed, I said, let's look at this from a common vision perspective, where we look at cross-selling between the banking operations and their loan production offices in places like New York and Chicago and Dallas, and our holding company operations. Let's see if the train moves along this track every day. Maybe we can load up the train with all these different products. And I didn't think much more about it, but six weeks later, a meeting was called of all the senior executives at Security Pacific headquarters, and the chairman presented a slideshow. And the title slide was Common Vision. And I knew then that my career was pretty much secure And those two events, I think, talking to the wives of the senior executives and indirectly them, you know, talking to their husbands and then the strategic planning for the organization. Yeah. And I love the story of branding. My presumption is that when you started that monthly magazine, Straight Talk, that that magazine did not exist before that. Did not. No, it was my idea. That was a great opportunity for you to get your message out and to get your name out. And it is a very important branding exercise. One of the things, Jeff, that happens with senior corporate executives is that it tends to be a one-way conversation with their direct reports and with their employee base. With Straight Talk, I opened it up to anybody. And my three requirements were open communication, accurate information, and timely presented. Those were the three things. And I said, if you have something to say, send it to the editor of Straight Talk, and I'll answer it. It's a wonderful, great example. You've read uh, Seven Rules of Power and apparently stayed awake doing so. And you and I, when we were together on Orcas Island, talked a lot about the overlaps of the seven rules. What do you think is the rule that resonates most with your sense of what has made you successful in your banking career? Networking relentlessly, I think, is a a good one. And that came up first in the Binkley for Congress, my brother running for Congress in Pasadena, where the co-chairman was Frank Wheat, who had been an SEC commissioner, and Nelson Rising, who had been responsible for putting John Tunney in the Senate, And Nelson recently died. Nelson was a real estate developer in the state of California. But they helped me when I went back to Chase looking for a job. And so that plus the fact that a family friend who was a small businessman in Pasadena 
I knew the chief financial officer of Security Pacific. When I left the music writing business in New York and came back to California, introduced me. And Frank Cowett really had no particular place for me and put me in the Southeast Division of Corporate Banking for Security Pacific, which was pretty much a dead end. But I looked at it and said, this is a great opportunity. Jimmy Carter had just been elected president, and uh, the Southeast was now known as the New South, with a lot of booming business and investment opportunity, which I developed the Coca-Cola relationship. I developed the Marriott relationship. I developed the Blunt Inc. relationship out of Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, We financed the University of Riyadh, of all places, through Blunt. And so it turned out that it was ripe ground for me. But that networking, and then I think, Jeffrey, using your power is important for me, both as a vice chairman of the bank and also on the board. But after the merger with B of A, it was clear that B of A was treating the merger not as one of equals, but as a takeover. And I realized that I was not going to be on the winning side. And I saw the two other senior officers from Security Pacific had left. Bob Smith was president of Bank of America as part of the deal, and he left early. Jerry Grunthofer, who was president of Security Pacific Retail Bank, took over the commercial banking of B of A, and then he left to become chairman of Star Bank. And I was left sort of solo, but I realized that the team that I had established in the financial services system were running up against some pretty difficult human resources severance issues. And I maintained my position within the Bank of America to the very end in order to make sure that the severance packages that were provided for my team were equitably distributed. When I left Bank of America, there was a bit of a surprise and some sour notes and some confusion. And shortly after I did leave, the president of B of A Venture Capital left and joined me to form Forrest Binkley and Brown, the venture capital firm that you mentioned earlier. So success, as you mentioned, excuses everything. Yeah, that's a great rule. I like your emphasis on networking, and I particularly like your willingness to move. I often tell my students that the number one sin I see them commit in their career is to believe that they can hang on in difficult circumstances. And I think your realization of, and I think it was an accurate realization, that this was a takeover and that your future was not going to be great and that therefore you needed to go find something else to do, which turned out, I think, to be very sensible and profitable and lucrative, was a smart thing to do. I think that shows your really excellent judgment. And of course, you have continued to network. I believe you've established a group of senior executives or senior, in some cases, retired people who sit around on occasion and talk about issues, politics, and social issues. And so you've continued, I think, to be very successful. Well, it's that group is up at the faculty club at, I think we call it the Athenaeum Dialogue at Caltech. And it's a group of both uh, conservatives and progressives. We look at public policy issues from a perspective of problem solving not from political positioning. Uh, There's one final topic I want to cover, and that is we also talked the other day about your songwriting. You are a singer, you are a songwriter, you are, in my judgment, quite talented. But you talked the other day about how you thought your songwriting and your music interests have helped you in your professional career in the sense of providing a release and relieving stress and tension. Could you speak a little bit to that? Well, songwriting has been something that I've done all my life, and I've been playing the guitar since I was seven years old, so I have a long history of it, and I even studied classical and flamenco guitar. Life is not a rehearsal, and there's a lot of toxicity, particularly in a corporate job like I had, and when you get far up that ladder, And the question is, how do you recycle that toxicity? 
Well, what do you do? You can't just let it fester. So golf tends to be a big outlet for a lot of executives, or tennis. But I know a number of executives who have found release in creative uh, jazz pianists that I know up in L.A. Uh, uh, Oscar Wilde once said that when bankers come together, they talk about art. And when artists come together, they talk about money. <laughs> but once I got into the workplace, and particularly in a high-stress corporate position, songwriting became a way of recycling that stress. And I know other executives who play a musical instrument also find that music in itself provides a kind of not just relief, but also a non-verbal way of looking at reality. And I believe that through music, there are patterns there's cadences, there's rhythm, there's melody, there's harmony, timing, etc., that informs executive decision making. And patterns are really important to be able to understand the reality. And it's, I can't stress enough how important it is if you're in an executive position to have a serious, creative, outlet, whether it's music or writing or painting, I'd say even golf. <laughs> well, Nick, thank you for sharing your insights and your story. We could talk for hours as we have in the past, but I want to be respectful of my listeners' time. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I am your host, Jeffrey Pfeffer. Today, we have been talking with my old friend and very successful financial executive, Nick Binkley, about his career in finance, rising to the position of vice chair of Security Pacific Bank and then vice chair of the Bank of America, and then a partner in a very successful venture capital firm. He has a lot of lessons for all of us to pay attention to. Thank you very much, Nick, for being with me. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. The Pfeffer on Power podcast is available on Spotify, on Apple, on your favorite platform, whatever that is. You can follow me on LinkedIn. I have a website, Jeffrey Pfeffer, that's P-F-E-F-F-E-R.com. We look forward to being with you again in two weeks for another episode of Pfeffer on Power. <laughs>